This is a big deal to a lot of people. For more on it, let's go to our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Tell us about how this thing is breaking down and what exactly went on today again. Now well, just what, the court is not supposed to hear a case unless it is timely. In other words, you just can't ask the court to declare a statute unconstitutional because you think it's unconstitutional. You have to have been harmed by it, or the harm coming your way has to be fairly clear. Ordinarily, the court decides when the case is timely. The legal phrase is ripeness. Is it ripe? In the case of paying taxes, Congress has decided when it is timely for the court to hear a challenge to a tax. And Congress has said, you want to challenge a tax, you pay it first. You give us the money first, and then you challenge whether or not we have the right to take it from you. This is a very small portion of this case, Shep. The big portion that most people are concerned about, which you just articulated, which will be argued tomorrow, is whether or not the Congress can force you to buy health care uh, insurance. But one aspect of that is, if you don't buy it, the Congress will extract money from you. Question, is that extraction a penalty, or is that extraction a tax? If it is a tax, then this 150-year-old statute which says you've got to pay the tax before you can challenge it may kick in. But from the sentiment of those in the courtroom today and from listening to the oral argument, a portion of which you just played, it is very clear. These justices want to hear this as much as we want them to hear it. They want to rule on it as much as we want an answer to it. They're not going to let this 150-year-old tax law interfere with whether or not they can rule on this case. Do they want to rule on it so badly because it's political and because it could help determine the course of human events in this country or for other reasons? Well, that's a very good question. Sometimes the justices do time their rulings. Think about it this way. If the court invalidates this health care mandate, would that help the president who could say, look, I tried to do what I thought was right and Republican appointees to the court invalidated it? Or will it hurt the president because it will enable his opponent to say, look, the court invalidated this and the president should have known it all along. I think the court wants to get heavy cases off its docket so it can get back to its normal routine. And if they're anxious to resolve this, it's a normal human anxiety. It's not an effort to want to influence the uh, presidential election. What takes this case to the level that they would have longer arguments on this than anything in decades? I think they want to show respect to the Congress for a 2,600-page statute. Wow. And they want to show respect to the states which have challenged it because 26 of the states have challenged All it. All with the Republican attorneys general. That's probably true. These, these challenges are executive decisions, not legislative decisions. Right. And I think they want to show deference to the public, which seems to have an overriding interest in the outcome of this case. This length of time is unusual, but there are many, many arguments and many, many litigants, and I think the court wants to fairly say, whichever way we go, we gave everybody ample time to speak. Got a prediction? <clears throat> based but, on what you know about these justices? Well, based upon what I know, I think they're going to invalidate the individual mandate. I think they're going to say that there, there is a limit to what Congress can order people to do. Whether that invalidation affects the rest of the case is something that can't be predicted. Mm -hmm. All right, Judge, should be an interesting, what, three, three days? It should be a week. very interesting week. Yeah, this is going to happen tomorrow and Wednesday as well. All right. Judge, thanks. Pleasure, Shep. Now, oral arguments at the Supreme Court are over uh, as far as the health care law. Uh, and the justices are weighing their decisions right now. Some critics claim, though, the Supreme Court themselves, the justices themselves, are crossing the line in a power grab. In fact, in an editorial in the Washington Post today, there is a suggestion that the court is now acting as an alternative, if you will, to Congress. Listen to part of this editorial. Quote, the conservative justices were obsessed with weird hypotheticals. If the federal government could make you buy health insurance, might it require you to buy broccoli or health club memberships, cell phones, burial services, and cars, all of which have nothing to do with an uninsured person getting expensive treatment that others, often taxpayers, have to pay for. Joining me now, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox's very own senior judicial analyst. So, Judge, this law has often been criticized as a power grab by the federal government. But now there's a different opinion. Maybe it's the Supreme Court doing that. Are we running the risk of this? Well, uh, let me start by saying that I know the writer of the editorial, and he's an intelligent person who's uh, arguing uh, that he was unhappy, essentially, with the tenor of the questions yesterday. But if you are familiar with an appellate courtroom, and this is the ultimate appellate courtroom, you know that judges often throw, quote, weird hypotheticals at lawyers to challenge their understanding of the law and to ask where the law might go next. 
think about it this way. The Supreme Court is very aware of its place in history. It sometimes thinks like the Vatican does, Jenna, not in days or weeks or months, but in generations or even centuries. And it wants to know, if we authorize the Congress to do this, to force people to buy health insurance that they might not want, might not need, and might not be able to afford, what will Congress force people to buy next? Well, so Judge, let me just stop you there. And this, this is something that the writer brought up as well. How do we know the justices are ruling on the law of the land and not on an ideology? Or is there a difference? Well, most justices on the Supreme Court are there because they um, enjoy and possess the same ideology as the president who appointed them. I think that Mr. Dion's editorial was probably a direct attack on Justice Scalia, who was appointed by President Reagan. The two of them believed in the federal system of government, that the Constitution gives limited, precisely delegated powers to the federal government and leaves the rest to the states. So it is Justice Scalia's job and the job of his colleagues to assure that Congress stays within the confines of the Constitution. The process of doing that job sometimes requires asking, quote, weird hypotheticals and even funny and sharp questions. I bet you know nothing about that, weird hypotheticals that some people <laughs> ask you about, uh, present company included in that. All right, Judge, a quick question about implementation. They're all working to figure out what their decision is going to be on this law. Right. Whatever their decision is, how quickly is that decision implemented? So let's just say, and I hate to deal with a hypothetic, that the, the health care law, the individual mandate goes out the door. Right. Then how quickly does that change things for the average person out there? Well, it will, it will stop the implementation of the individual mandate, which, is, as you know, doesn't kick in until 2014. But it will also undo some things that have already been done. Some states, for example, have already spent tax dollars on setting up the, the state ex insurance exchanges, basically an expansion of Medicaid uh, to people who can't afford health insurance. Those will collapse. The federal government has already spent billions of dollars. It's not going to get that money back. But the law authorizing the expenditure of that money will end. Basically, the Supreme Court, if this is invalidated, will say nothing can happen from here on forward. And what has already happened, just dismantle it in a reasonable period of time. A reasonable period of time, but not a specific period of time. Correct. All right. Well, we'll still have to see again. Uh, only hypothetics at this point. Judge, always nice to see you. Thank you so much. I am glad your hypotheticals were not <laughs> weird. They will be someday, <laughs> most days, Judge. Thanks. Pleasure, Jenna. It's always good to get the judge laughing. Supremes on center stage after six hours of arguments that bunch of Supreme Court justices set to decide the fate of the president's overhaul of our health care system. It is, of course, a complex case, but the biggest issue really is whether Congress can legally require Americans to buy health care insurance or, I mean, frankly, anything. And now the justices are hard at work. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is with us now. Where are we, do you know? Well, where we are is the court probably, this is, this is all done in secret, so if it follows its normal routine, met in secret mm -hmm. at 10 o'clock this morning without any law clerks there, with just the nine of them in the room, and they take a, a preliminary vote on a series of issues so that they know what the sides are on each of the issues, and then the senior justice on each side, the chief justice is deemed senior, whichever side he's on, assigns one member of, of, of that side to write an opinion. So basically, opinions will be drafted and they'll be circulated. Let's say hypothetically, the initial vote is five to four to invalidate the individual mandate. The wording of the opinions is very key because depending on how broadly or narrowly it's worded, a four-person minority could pick off a justice from the other side and soon become a five-person majority. So just because this preliminary vote went one way does not mean that that will be the ultimate outcome. You know the scary part is if they, keep, if they strike the mandate but keep the law, are, is, are we just screwed then? Is well, the whole country just screwed? We are in a very, very precarious and almost impossible political pickle, if you will, Ugh. because the, the law was enacted without any Republican support whatsoever, and you have the Republicans controlling the House of Representatives. Even though the idea of a mandate in a national health care was a Republican idea a long time ago, but it's now since it's a Democratic president, right? Isn't that how it worked? Well, <laughs> right? it getting, was, wasn't it? You could, yes, oh, yes, course, it yeah. was. Just I, mean, to, I mean, revisionist history is fun, but it's, it doesn't work here. The, the, if the court doesn't strike the entire thing down, Congress will be left with a very difficult and nearly impossible task of deciding what it wants to work and what it doesn't want to work. 
and people, for example, young people who are between the ages of 19 and 26 that are on their parents' insurance, mm -hmm. because the statute requires that, they might be left in limbo. The parents may have already paid an insurance premium. The carrier will want to drop those kids. A lot of money has been spent by states that have con commenced construction of their exchanges, basically an expansion uh, of Medicaid. Especially big states. Correct. Some states have not. New Jersey, for example, has not. Governor Christie hopes the statute is invalidated. Other states have started it already because they expect the uh, mandate to be, uh, to be upheld. What happens to that money that's been uh, spent? Who's going to benefit by it? Uh, Justice Scalia said, look, you really want us to go through 2,600 pages and decide which line is in and which line is out? Isn't that really a legislative function, or shouldn't we invalidate everything or uphold everything? What, what expertise does the court have to decide which line survives and which line doesn't? It's rarely do we see a case like this, Shep. Hmm. And, and, and it could affect the course of human events, really, along more than health care lines. Yes, it could, because the court thinks like the Vatican. Hear me out. It doesn't think in terms of days or weeks or months. It thinks in terms of generations and centuries. It thinks in terms of what will a future Congress or a future court do with federal power if we don't define it properly right now. Never mind this controversy. What will it be like 50 years from now if we don't do the right thing? This is an opportunity for the court to curtail or unleash the Congress. This is going to be good. Of course, we have to wait till June, so have a nap. Let's bring in Fox senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, you think that this law is going to be essentially thrown out entirely? Well, I do, uh, John, just from the tenor of the justices during the oral argument. You know, an, an oral argument before the Supreme Court of the United States is not a test of the best lawyer, it's not a test of the law, and it's certainly not a game particularly when the, when the nation's eyes are watching. For Justice Kennedy to have asked the questions that he did in as early on in the argument as he did, in as sharp a way as he did, using a particular code word that he did, tells me that he has decided that this law is outside the confines of the Constitution. That's step number one. Step number two, of course, is what to do with the law. Do they invalidate just the parts that profoundly offend the Constitution? Or they do, do they decide that if they remove those parts, the rest of the law doesn't make any sense, and they might as well invalidate the whole thing? That is a process that the court will eventually come to a consensus on after it takes the initial votes, how they want to vote on the major issues, and then the justices who are assigned to write the uh, opinions and dissents begin writing those opinions and dissents, and they begin circulating them among the other justices. This thing was shepherded through Congress, or maybe rammed through Congress, under Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. She has said a number of interesting things, including the fact that we have to pass this bill before we can find out what's in it. Right. She also asked whether, uh, well, incredulously, she was asked whether this bill was constitutional. Here is an exact transcript of what she had to say. I believe we have it. Uh, at any rate, she said, Speaker, where, where specifically does the, uh, the Constitution grant Congress the authority to enact an individual health insurance mandate? Uh, are you serious? Yeah. Are you serious? Yes, yes, yes. We knew what we were doing when we passed this bill. It is ironclad constitutionally. What happens in the courts is another matter. Okay, so ironclad constitutionally, but maybe not according to the Supreme Court? Well, uh, I, I, in, in fairness to her, I think she's speaking as a politician, not as a lawyer and not as a legal scholar. But I remember we interrogated uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn, the number three ranking Democrat. Where in the Constitution is the federal government authorized to manage health care? He looked at me and he goes, Judge, most of what we do down here is not authorized by the Constitution. They are simply concerned with staying in power and with bringing home the bacon. They are not concerned with whether or not what they do is authorized by the supreme law of the land. I think that Mrs. Pelosi will be unhappily surprised when we learn finally how the Supreme Court comes down on this in June. But for her to suggest that there isn't even a constitutional argument to be made 
reveals an embarrassing indifference or ignorance on her part. There have been an awful lot of suggestions, primarily from the left, from talking heads on television and so forth, that if this court strikes down the law, it is going to be legislating. It's going to be writing uh, law and maybe subverting the will of Congress. I suppose that last one could be accurate, but legislating? Well, you know, that's an argument that both sides of the aisle make when a statute that they like is overturned. But think about it. The Supreme Court is the anti-democratic branch of the government. Its whole purpose is to assure that the Constitution is enforced, even when the majority is wrong. If we didn't have a system like this, then nothing could prevent a runaway majority in the Congress from taking the liberty or the property or the, or the lives of whomever they wanted to take. Well, the, the good news about all of this to me is that it has been a fascinating lesson in history and the workings of the Constitution and co-equal branches of government and all of that kind of thing. Yes, it has. You have an expert on the Constitution seated right next to you, John. <laughs> I do. Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thank you for the I'm going to let her out. speak now. It's always <laughs> nice. Judge, you're Thanks. welcome back anytime, Judge right. Napolitano. Okay, three days of intense arguments over that controversial health care law wrapping up in the Supreme Court. So the question now becomes, now what? Judge Andrew Napolitano is the Fox News senior judicial analyst. He is here with some answers. For a minute, I thought Liz was imitating me when she went, now, now what? what? <laughs> That's so you, right? I'm channeling you. It's, it's the Jewish-Italian mix there. It's exactly. a very, you use your hand. All right. Uh, first of all, this is something that you and I have talked about. I talked to Pam Bondi about it, the attorney general from the state of Florida yesterday. Right. Whether or not the same mandate that forces us to buy into a Social Security pension plan, which is a product of a kind, people sell retirement plans all the time, whether that was the same as forcing people to buy an insurance product. Here's kind of her answer. She didn't seem prepared for it. Play the side. Well, people participate in Social Security. Not voluntarily. When they have... If I had a choice, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but people who are employed participate in Social Security. We all have it taken out but of our paychecks. But it's a mandate. Checks. Again, but, it is but, a mandate. It's not a voluntary purchase. But this is different because this is not an act. And th they're also saying this is not a tax, so if you recall that. Well, forgive me. I love Pam Bondi, but I don't see the difference. And here's what your friend, Justice Sam Alito, said yesterday. He said the new health care law forces young, healthy people, quote, to subsidize services that will be received by somebody else. That's the definition of Social Security, as it is now. Well, when the when Social Security was challenged in 1935, the Supreme Court. Found, 37. For, well, the challenge was filed in 35. The decisions in 37, the Supreme Court said it was a tax. And because it was a tax, Congress could spend it any way it wanted as long as it was generally enhanced the general welfare. So if Congress wants to add a surtax, uh, I'm suggesting this is the Supreme Court ruling. I'm not defending it. I'm summarizing it. If Congress wants to add a surtax to your income tax and dedicate that additional tax to paying you when you no longer work, Congress can do that under the Constitution. We view that differently today. I think you're right. Today we view that as the purchase of a package because we could go out, your viewers could go out and purchase uh, a pension package almost anywhere, even, even in this building. That was not the case when Social Security uh, came about. So the court, look, the government threw everything they could at the court. First, the government said it was voluntary because you didn't have to work. The court said that's ridiculous. Then the court said, then the government said it's a savings plan. We're taking the money for you, enhancing it, and giving it back to you when you retire. And the court said that's ridiculous. Then the government said it's a tax. And the court said, well, you can't challenge the amount of a tax in court. You can only challenge the amount of the tax at a ballot box. Okay, let's get to the actual health care law. And if some type of change is deemed to be made by the Supreme Court, what is the survivability of the rest of it and in what form? And you could call it, I guess, the severability that if they find that that part of the, the law, the insurance requirement should be excised and cut off, does the rest of it survive? Now, I'll do my best uh, Justice uh, Scalia imitation. Okay. You mean to tell me that we have to go through 2,700 pages of documents and we have to decide which line survives and which line doesn't? That's basically the argument that he made today. Even Justice Kennedy went along with this argument uh, to Attorney General Verrilli, leading us to believe if the questions are a sincere representation of the values of the justices asking those questions, that they believe that uh, the individual mandate will be invalidated and therefore, 
the rest of the statute will fall because it would be an impossible task for judges to decide which stays and which doesn't. It's almost an economic determination, uh, David, which would be beyond the the ability of judges to determine. Congress would need experts to tell it which survives the removal of the individual mandate and what doesn't. All right. The, The other part that they were talking about today was requiring states to expand their Medicaid. Apparently, a lot of people are not going to be covered by their employers. Or employers say, we can't afford it. And that those people will be insured by the state exchanges, even though a lot of states haven't done anything to start an exchange. 26 states say that's, that's unconstitutional because it's the feds requiring the states to raise taxes this, locally. This part is not as clear from the oral argument as to what the outcome will be. Because many conservative justices believe that if the states are foolish enough to take federal dollars, they have to accept the strings that come with the federal dollars. Normally the feds will pay for 100% of something, paving roads, in return for the string, lowering speed limits. Here the feds are paying 90% and they're saying to the states, you raise the other 10% and then you spend all 100, the 90 we give you and the 10 you raise the way we tell you to do it. So it's a little different here. Question, can the Congress order the states to raise taxes? state taxes, and then tell the states how to spend the money. That's what the Supreme Court had to decide. It's not clear which way they're going to go on that. We have two seconds. Best guess. Does this thing fall or stand? The, the individual mandate falls. A guess now. A guess yeah. from my years of experience. Uh, and that will, co- that will cause the rest of the statute to fall. Okay. you got to say it like this. That'll like this. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, thank you so much. Pleasure. So it's all or nothing. I think it's all or nothing, yes. Mm-hmm. Judge Napolitano, and for those of you who don't know, the judge has a huge social media <laughs> following. Hundreds of your fans visited the After, Bell, After the Bell Facebook page today just in anticipation of your segment. So thank you. We, we are- in the wake of the Supreme Court arguments over Obamacare, the White House tonight trying to, it seems to, rebrand the individual mandate. They are now referring to it as the Personal Responsibility Clause, here to talk about the constitutionality of that law and... Uh, uh, the individual responsibility uh, provision. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, great to have you with us. Thank you, Lou. Judge, I, I'm going to start. Were you thinking that about this time you'd be hearing the White House talk about personal responsibility provisionally or otherwise? No, I didn't. Nor did I think that the White House can take out the sting from this unconstitutional law by giving it a different name. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting stratagem. But in any, what, are, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, the Commerce Clause Obamacare itself, it looks like it all rides on the justices' determination within within the uh, Commerce Clause. A, a lot of us were surprised at the ferocity of Justice Kennedy's questions, the quickness with which he asked them, and the directness that he uh, with which he aimed them at the Solicitor General. This is not a game at this level. This is not a law school argument. This is not a test of the when we lawyer's hear, knowledge. This is a serious effort to get at the truth. The justices are not doing we, this we, to trick people. Well, yeah, we heard a number of people, a number of analysts uh, suggest, well, you know, they, it's probably just devil's advocacy. They're not really serious about the question. They seem very serious to me. How They did. And Justice Kennedy knows he's the swing vote. He knows he sits in the middle between four pretty committed conservatives and four pretty committed liberals. He knows that the entire legal community and much of the political community and much of the nation was watching him. And he expressed very serious doubts about whether the Constitution authorizes the Congress to go as far as it went in this case. There there seems to be a, 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 if you will, a predilection toward rescuing, salvaging part of this law on the part of some of the justices if they were to throw out the individual mandate. Why? Well, because there's a, there's a general uh, constitutional principle that, that what the Congress does is presumed to be valid, lawful, and constitutional. And even this Congress? Well, yeah, even this Congress. <laughs> and the court should only remove that which is obviously unconstitutional and save the rest. But this statute might not be rational. It might not make sense without the individual mandate in there. Could some of the things about the creation of this law come back and reduce the court's instinct, as you say, to salvage, to to rescue some well, of this. Justice- For example, the Speaker of the House saying things like, you've got to pass this law in order to find out what's in it. Right. 2,800 pages. We heard Justice Scalia talk about the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, right. uh, to even read it. Uh, and the fact that a Democrat voting 
became the sixth, the 60th vote in the Senate. His name is Arlen Specter, and he had just previously been a Republican who traded out to make Obamacare happen. Not a single Republican supporting it in the House. My God, this doesn't look like a popular expression of the will to I, me. I agree with everything that you said, but the court is trained not to look at that. Okay, that's trust what I me, was curious. Trust me, they are accustomed I trust you to implicitly. looking at convoluted laws that are poorly drafted and that make no sense. That's what they do uh, for a living. Their job is to see if this thing fits within the confines of the Constitution, and I think you're going to find that by a 5-4 to four vote, they're going to say, no, it does not fit within the confines of the Constitution. What do we do with the rest of it? Do we go through all 2,700 pages and decide what stays and what goes? Justice Scalia said throw no it way. out and say, <laughs> Congress, start all over. All right. This is where you make your money. What will the Supreme Court do? Will they throw it out or will they simply throw out the individual mandate? I think they're going to throw out the entire statute. The Congress had the option of saying in the statute, if you have to carve out anything, preserve the rest, called the severability option. Congress rejected that option. It was in one of the drafts, and they took it out before it went to the president for his signature. That signals to the court the whole thing rises or the whole thing falls. All right. And we Judge, have to wait till June to find out. Well, I know that part. All right. <laughs> we had to turn to you for the rest of it. Thank you. Judge Napolitano, great to